Amen. How many glad to be here today? Man, we are so glad that you're here today. If this is your first time, we welcome you. We pray that this will not be your last time. We pray that you just lean on in today and just enjoy the presence of the Lord, His amazing grace that is here today. Um, and we welcome, hopefully you got, you would, you would get a bag um, today and it's just a, a card in there. If you would, just fill that out. We want to connect. You'll get afterwards, you'll get an awesome uh, gift. Uh, speaking of gifts, if you haven't seen it, um, in the foyer there, we put like a little merch room. We got a ton of stuff in there. We are raising money for our Christmas VBS. A lot of churches... A lot, of, a lot of churches do uh, a summertime VBS. We do a Christmas VBS. It's held at the Weirton campus. Uh, it's amazing. It's just a walk through. Uh, you just got to go. You just got to go. But raising money for that. So we have a little merch room. So afterwards, cash only. Um, man, ton of stuff in there. There's shirts. There's uh, uh, cups. There's tumblers. We got a new, um, help me, Stephanie. We got, what is it? Car freshener, thank you. We got a car freshener or a house freshener. Or as my mom, my mama bought one back there, and she's, I was like, oh, let me smell that, because today was the first day of the launch. And I was like, oh, it smells so good. And where are you going to put it? So I'm putting it in the house. I'm just going to hang it in the house. Let the Holy Ghost just go. I was like, all right, mama, go ahead with your bad self. Um, but if you get a chance after service, it'll be available. Hey, special, a special guest today. No, it's not special, but it is special to me. Uh, my wife is preaching today. So if you would, put your hands together. Welcome my wonderful wife as she comes and shares the word of the Lord today. Listen, just going to give you a heads up. If she, like, runs off the stage and throws the microphone at me, that means Josiah has called. So he's doing great. Um, he usually calls on Sundays. He usually calls a little bit later. But she's like, what do we do if he calls, like, because he called in the middle of yeah. You're going to preach an answer at the same time? Just just preach it to him. And uh, he called in the middle as she was at school. Um, he's in Georgia, and the hurricane kind of come through there, and so they were allowed just one phone call real quick. So he called mom at school and said he was doing great and he's fine. And uh, just keep praying for his health. they running and working out and all that in the rain. Um, they took a couple days because the wind was real bad down there. Uh, made it through the gas chamber, made it through a bunch of stuff, but he's doing, he sounds great. He does, he was joking with his mom. He originally told us he broke his arm. He called mom. He's like, I'm calling to let you know I broke my arm. And we're like, what? And he's like, just playing. Yeah, so just, just, just hot, hot mess. And uh, Stephanie said this, it, it, and I want to say this because I know uh, some people have asked, um, he, said, he said, please be careful about giving my address out or sending things um, because he said, Stephanie said, well, I sent you seven letters. He's like, oh, mom. He's like, why? He's like, that's like 200 push-ups. Like, I'm going to be there forever now. Like, don't send any more. She said, well, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm sending more, so get ready for more push-ups, you know, so it is what it is. But, hey, let's welcome, let's welcome my wonderful wife here today with her mamacita outfit. Come on, do it today, girl. Amen. Kid is picking on my shirt. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm just got to represent my people, right? <laughs> a, a lady at school that got a <laughs> side story. A ton of avocados. Kroger delivered her eight bags of avocados instead of eight avocados. And she sent me a message, do I want some avocados? She brought me all of them, all seven bags. I go, girl, I am Latino, but I'm not that Latino. <laughs> like, I cannot eat seven bags of avocados. But so, yeah, and I happened to be wearing that shirt that day, so it didn't help my cause. Uh, <laughs> she brought them to me. All right, I'm excited to, to be with you guys this morning. We had a great time in, in first service, and... Um, I was a hot puddle of sweat afterwards, so let's, I'm going to lose some weight today, amen? That's the goal, right? <laughs> um, well, I, we're going to be looking at one of my favorite people in the Bible. I don't like to use the word character because character implies that they're made up. And how many you know these people lived and breathed and lived this life, and we were so blessed that they wrote it down so you and I can live and breathe and work this life out too through their examples and it, it's the story of Hannah and I love Hannah's story not just because she's one of those rare cases 
in the word of God where a woman is the center of a story. It's not often that that happens, um, but that her story is so relevant to all of us, even though her issue is she is barren, that we can't negate the fact that her experience does apply to all of us because all of us, at some point in this life, have walked a barren road. We have lived a barren experience. Um, last week in Bible study, um, one of the things that we looked at in our, our study was the patterns and rhythms of God. And um, one of the most beautiful patterns and rhythms of God is seasons. And they happen in the natural and they happen in the, in the spiritual as well, that we go through these seasons with God. And I, I asked my group to take a moment and to think about what season are you in? Because no matter what, you're always in a season. You know, you don't get to miss out on the seasons. You don't get to say, you know, God, I'm opting out of spring this year because I don't like allergies. You, you're going, spring is coming. Fall is coming. It's just, it's just the pattern of life. And it happens so in the spiritual that we, we go through these seasons in life. And you have to take the time to acknowledge, Lord, what season am I in with you? Because they come and go. They're fluid. So because you have to know what season you're in so that you're prepared for that season. Because you're not going to dress for summer if you're in the winter season. You are not going to dress for winter and go hang out at the beach in 100 degree weather. You are going to be prepared for the season that you were in. So what season are you in? And the season that Hannah was in before we read her story really quickly is she was in a winter season, which let's be honest is the hardest season. I don't like winter. Anybody who knows me knows I can't stand being cold. It's depressing. It's dreary. It's the long nights. I love sunshine. It's, when the sun is setting at six o'clock, I feel like I, I have no, it drains me of all my energy. I would, I would, summertime, I'm running to Walmart at 10 o'clock at night. Sun's still shining. But it's six o'clock in the winter. I'm like, ah. Eh. That's all right, I don't need to go. Because I'm drained. I'm drained. It psychologically messes with you. Winter is a season of barrenness. It's a season of unproductivity. It's a season of unfruitfulness. It's a season of prolonged darkness. It's bitter. It's cold. It's isolation. And you don't get to escape this life without your share of barren winter seasons. We're going to read Hannah's story just really quickly. I apologize that it's long, and I actually want to read. I brought, I, I brought my, the, I have a lot of Bibles, and I brought the wrong one. I don't like normally reading from my phone. I don't know why, but here we go. I'm reading from the NIV. I'm reading 1 Samuel 1 through 15. I might skip over some parts for time. There was a certain man from Ramathan, a Zuphite, from the hill country of Ephron, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jerahem, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuph, an Ephraimite. He had two wives, one called Hannah and the other Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat, give portions of the meat to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. Any of you know any Peninas? <laughs> Tina said that too loud. This went. Hopefully it's not me, Tina. <laughs> this went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband, Elkanah, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Elkanah's clueless. Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, which actually translates Lord of hosts, Lord of heaven's army. If you will only look on your servant's mercy 
servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son. Then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. And it goes on that Eli kind of judges her because she was praying in such bitterness of soul, he assumed she was drunk. I think she might have been speaking in tongues for the first time because her heart could not put to words what was inside of her, and he assumed she was drunk. And then she goes home, and she, she um, conceives a child. That's the, the kind of the rest, a little bit of the rest of the story. But I want us to look at Hannah. We, we now see her, the premise of what she's facing in this dilemma that she's in. And we understand that she is in a winter. She is in this barren place. And as I said earlier, you and I don't get to live this life. Nobody lives this life and escapes winter. All right? It comes. And sometimes, we, if we're honest, we say that, man, it, it, I feel like I'm always in winter. I feel like I get out of winter for a second and then another winter comes. I feel like Hannah, that it's been year as after year after year after year. When is my spring going to come? I just constantly feel I'm in winter. Maybe your winter is something with your marriage or the relationships that you're in, that they're frigid and cold and disconnected and isolated. Maybe you're dealing with a winter season with your children that you're watching the decisions they make draw them further from God and you see the hardening of their hearts and that, that, that watching and that seeing and that you've planted seed after seed their whole life and the child that you have raised is not the child that you're seeing and you see them heading into a winter and of course as a parent that, that brings the winter on your heart and you are grieving and you are sad and you're mourning for them. Financial situations that that are bleak and dismal can get you into a winter season. When, you, when your jobs and your careers that you have drain you of life and you just, you just robotically are going and you feel you're getting nothing out of it and you just feel like you're in this winter or maybe you have lost a job recently and you don't know how, how you're going to make ends meet and there never seems to be an answer. There never seems to be a solution and there's just winter is upon you. Maybe it's a health battle that you're facing and it's draining you, and, and it's leading you. You feel like you're just decaying in, in, in your mind and in your body and your spirits and your faith is in this winter, in that season. It's a season marked with loss. When you've lost someone you love, if you've ever lost a child or a parent or a spouse, that season of grief is a winter season that nobody really can get you through. You, you just have to get through on you. Nobody, nobody, nothing that anybody says really helps, let's be honest, because you are in a winter season, seasons where life isn't producing the results you expect. You're looking and you're comparing and you're scrolling on Facebook and you're seeing all the paninas getting blessed and you're wondering, God, how is that possible? I'm faithfully serving in church. I'm faithfully at church. I tithe and I, I do this. I, feel, I almost feel like I'm checking everything off the religious check box. And here I am. And Penina is just smiling away in Tahiti. And I'm here in Fallensby, West Virginia. Well, this isn't, the math isn't mathing, Lord. And you're like, when is the winter going to end? You are in a winter season. And to fully appreciate Hannah's situation, we have to look at her whole landscape. Because when you're in a winter, the landscape changes. And she is, she, we have to look at that and, and just assess, like, what is going on in her world? Kenan is very much, he's very observant. All right, and he's always telling me to be very aware of my surroundings, and I'm not. I'm terrible. We can, if we're traveling, he can tell me there is an unmarked police car three cars back on, in the right lane, and that third car back, I've passed them six times, and they keep riding. He could, he could tell you, and it, it, he just knows that I'm over there just this passenger princess sleeping, drinking my coffee on Facebook, and he, I'm not even aware not even remotely aware. I love my life. <laughs> but you need to be aware of your surroundings. So let's, let's look at Hannah, if you don't mind, if I can teach you some things here. First of all, we see that her self-worth was under attack. When you are in a winter season, sometimes one of the first things that gets attacked is your self-worth. 
for her being in a barren woman at this time in history was not good. It, it wasn't by choice. We live in a society now that girls can decide, you know what, I don't want to have kids. I don't, I, we're going to get married, but I, I just don't want to have children, you know. I don't know why not. They're amazing. But people don't, I, I work with a woman who's like, I never want to have kids. I'm like, what are you, who's going to take care of you when you're old? Your dogs can't do that. We're like, that's where my mind goes. Like, who's going to come visit you and put your teeth in? Like, <laughs> Uh uh-uh, I need somebody. I don't know which one of our kids is going to do that for me. <laughs> Probably, I don't know, Noah. <laughs> but that's where my mind goes. Like, who doesn't want kids? But at this time, the pressure was real, ladies, because it, w- it, was, it was wealth. It signified wealth. Because the more children you had, the wealthy your family was because they could produce more. So the kids, you had kids to work for you. If we did that now, we would be, CPS would be called. We can't have kids to make them work, all right? Um, they, but they, they, they went and they were, they were the labor. They went and worked the fields. They went and watched over the flock. They, David was working. I mean, child labor laws were, were not in effect when David was out there when Samuel came to find him, all right? That they, 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 you had them to work. You also had them to carry on the line, the, the lineage, and you had a slew of them because at this time in history, a lot of boys died in battle. They were constantly warring. So you, you, you could have, we need 10 just in case we lose five. So you, you had to have children. And the burden of having the children was always on the woman. The flaw was with her. Not, never with the man. It was always her fault. So by, by, by those, those cultural dynamics, Hannah was an outcast in a sense. She would have been a social pariah. She would have been rejected in many ways. She would have been just not, they would have felt sorry for her, but mainly they would have looked at her like something was wrong with her. So her self-worth would have been under attack. Sometime winter seasons can be a plague on our self-worth, especially if the area you are experiencing barrenness is tied to your perceived identity. When what is lacking is a title or a position or a relationship, and that's how you've always identified yourself. Anybody who's been, a, been through a divorce and you've always defined, de, defined yourself as Mrs. somebody or Mr., and that, that barrenness comes and that relationship's over and now your identity is messed up, then your self-worth begins to falter. But our self-worth isn't ever tied in our identity. That's where we get it wrong. Our self-worth is tied in his identity. That is why it's so important to always have him as who we first identify as, as a child of God. In Philippians 1.20, it says, For I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed but that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ whether I live or die. Paul said, my identity is in nothing else but him, that no matter what I do, I'm not going to bring him shame, whether I lose this title or get that promotion or I I lose the house or buy the boat, whatever it is, whatever it is, I'm bringing honor and glory to him because my identity is not in me, it's in him. And whether I live or die, He is my identity. And the enemy has this identity theft that he has deceived you and he is re-identifying you according to the standards of the world. And I, I need you to wake up and realize that the world does not define your identity. The word of God defines your identity. That is why you need to know what the word of God says because if you don't know what the word of God says and it's easy to, it's easy to convince you that your identity is in something else instead of him. My identity is not in, in a job. It's not in my relationships. It's not in a title. It's not in any social media presence. Our identity is in him. Besides her self-worth being completely under attack in this years of, of wilderness barren experience, she also had some very strenuous relationships. You, and two of them were right in the home. 
right there in the home. Let me tell you, when you're in a winter season, you want, when it's cold outside, and I have to make that run from the car to the house, I just want to get in there and I wanted it to be warm, and I, I put on Kendon's hunting socks that I steal from him to get my feet nice and warm. And, and I, I, you, want, you, want, you want that safety of home. But when the, when the winter is in the home, when the winter is behind the doors, when the winter cannot be shut out because it's in the relationships you have in that domesticated setting, those are one of the hardest winters to waver through because there's no escape. It's home, and it should be safe. And poor Hannah has a real dilemma here because she has to share her home with a man who loves her but doesn't understand her and a woman who hates her but does understand her. So she is in the middle of this whole, this awful love triangle where she is not fully understood and not fully loved. And there's nothing worse than not being fully understood. And you're trying to explain your situation to your mates and you're trying to articulate it and you're in a winter but you can't find the words and they just don't understand and like, well, isn't my love enough? No human love is enough. No human relationship. me out of a winter. He may walk beside me. He may pray for me. He may encourage me, but it is not his job to pull me out of winter because he did not hang the moon and the stars. He did not form the earth. He didn't tell the oceans how far to come. My God Almighty is the one who did that, and that's the only one who can see me fully through a winter. So she is in this situation, and she's here by really her husband's design because it wasn't God's design for man to have two wives. And let's be honest, where, who thinks that would ever work? I, I told first, I don't even like sharing my shoes. What? No. <laughs> Ain't happening. But the, the hist historians believe that he married Hannah first. That's why her name is mentioned first. And because she couldn't have children, he did what was culturally acceptable, and he married somebody else. That was man's design, never God's design, because God's word said that the man should leave his family and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one. Not three, not five become one. That's the wrong, that's, that's some common core math, all right? That two shall become one. And he invited, thinking he was fixing the solution, and sometimes we think we're fixing something and we only muddle things up more. And he brought dysfunction into their home, and he brought in a woman that, that harassed her and brutally just verbally attacked her all the time and tore her apart limb by limb spiritually and mentally and emotionally till almost there was nothing left of Hannah. So this woman, Panina provoked Hannah. The word provoke means vex, to anger. You ever have somebody that just the sight of them vexes you? You have a Penina. Now you can say, hey, Penina. Penina is the original Regina George, in my opinion, if you know who Regina George is. And if you teach sixth grade long enough, you're like, ooh, you are a Penina. Because you're, she's the kind of girl that would just say something, and it seems like a compliment, but really it's not. And I could see, I could see that. Here's the beautiful thing about Penina, though. She's not in the rest of the book. Her, she doesn't even get a voice in this story. She doesn't even, once, once, once Hannah has a baby, who is Penina? Nobody knows. Nobody knows what happened to her. Because she doesn't have... She has just a small role in your story if you have a Penina. And the only reason she is there is for God to do something through that situation to bring him glory. Jesus had a Judas. Hannah had a Penina. I don't know who you have, but tomorrow you just need to go and say, you know what? I thank God for you because he is getting ready to do something in me because of you.
Sometimes you just have to thank God for Paninas because she is going to break her down to a point where all that is left is to reach up and get a hold of God. James 3.16 says, For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. The truth is, Penina was jealous. Penina was envious. Your winter may be somebody else's spring. They both wanted what the other had. Hannah wanted children. Penina wanted love. And for years, I was kind of like wanted to throat punch Penina, but my heart breaks for Penina. Because all of that hurt and that envy, it's coming from a place of rejection. It's coming from a place of hurt. It's coming from a place that all I was good for was to, to have your children, but you couldn't love me. You couldn't even give me a double portion. You couldn't acknowledge me. The same thing you see with Leah, because see, this whole concept isn't new. You see this dynamic happen two other times in the Bible. You see it with Sarah, Abraham, and Hagar, and you see it with Jacob, Leah, and Rachel. In both, all three of these situations, you have a barren woman, a loving husband, and a, a divisive person bringing discord, which lets me know that any time that you are in a barren wilderness winter situation, chances are you are going to have a place, a source of support, and then you are going to have a source of division in your life. And you better know very quickly to determine which is which. <laughs> to know who is there for you and who is against you. But I want you to really notice, if you look at that scripture again, was not that she provoked Hannah, but when she provoked Hannah. When you read it, it says that every time she went to the tabernacle. It wasn't when Hannah was washing the dishes, because I'm not going to provoke you. I'm going to encourage you. Girl, you're doing such a good job. Keep washing those dishes. It wasn't when Hannah was helping with the laundry. It wasn't when she was helping put baby 10 down to bed. It wasn't when she was doing her wifely, shared wifely duties because unfortunately she would have had to work with Penina to take care of the household and wipe the bottoms of somebody else's babies and the snot off of somebody else's baby. Let me tell you what a break a mama's heart when she's taking care, and taking care of a sick child that isn't hers and all she wants is her own. But she would have done that. Penina didn't attack her then because she was of use to her. She, the word was very specific that when she was going into the house of God, let me tell you what, when you are in a winter season, that the enemy is going to come after you every time you make up your mind to get around other believers. Whether it is to come to church, whether it's to come to Bible studies, whether it's to get together with coffee, all of a sudden, everything is going to attack you and come at you and give you reasons and, oh, I got a headache, I don't feel like going to church today, I'll just watch on Online. You will excuse your way out of the presence of God because the last thing the enemy wants you to be is here in the house of God when you are in a winter season. Because in the fellowship of others, there's healing. There's iron sharpening iron. There's accountability. There's encouragement. There's word going forth. And we have, we have Bible studies of men and the women, and you're not going because you're, I'm too busy, but you're in a winter. How long do you want to stay in that winter? God is saying, God, it's not by chance that it was always when she was going into the presence of God because where his presence is is fullness of joy. Where his presence is, there's healing. Where his presence is, there's the balm of Gilead for that broken heart. In his presence. And Penina was very clever to make sure that she made it hard for her to enter in. Year after year. It's one thing to have a, a short season of winter. People help you when it's a small season. People bring you food when it's a, just a little window. But if that winter reaches into month five, the encouragement stops coming, 
the calls stop, the text messages to check, no more food, forget the food train. The food train is, is ran out of gas. But when you're in year one and year two, and then eventually it becomes nobody even realizes your inner winter because you've become so isolated. And then eventually those are the people that slowly creep away from church because they're not understanding why am I not getting my breakthrough? Why we're singing about this God who heals and I'm not healed. We're singing about this God who restores and I don't feel that. We're singing about a God of breakthrough and, and all these things about him. And, and I, I don't get how they're still worshiping and they're still do that. But here's the thing. It's not about how you feel. It's about who he is. And he's trying to get you from woe is me to worship me. He's trying to get you out of a victim mentality to a victory mentality that even in your winter, it's easy to praise him in spring. The flowers are blooming, the chirp birds are chirping, all of nature seems to be worshiping him. But when the winter winds are howling and the cold air is coming and the trees are dying and there's nothing on the ground and even the animals are scrounging for food, you are in this winter. It is hard to praise, but let me tell you, that is the exact moment you need to lift your hands and say, Lord Almighty, God of heaven's army, I worship and I I adore you. You are holy. When he was singing this, telling us to sing, it's so simple. Worship isn't complicated. It's not. It comes from you, the depths of you. God, you are holy. You are holy, holy, holy. You are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of our adoration. We just venerate you right now in this house and we give you, it's not difficult. But the enemy will keep you from that in your winter season because the last thing he wants you to do is worship God through your pain. But I'm going to tell you what, as someone who has experienced my own seasons of winter, me personally, together as a couple, together in ministry as parents, the only thing that has ever seen me through is a heart of worship to get before him and praise him. So she begins to do something different with this situation. Because let me tell you what, there is some very ironic things happening here for her. First of all, her name. Her name, Hannah, means favored one. Let me tell you, at this time in history, when they said your name, you really heard the meaning. Like my name means crowned one. That's probably why I'm a passenger princess. I don't know. Just put that together. But I don't hear crowned one. I think you should start calling me that. <laughs> crowned one. <laughs> but, but they would have. They would have heard favored one. Let me tell you what, the irony of every, and if, you, if you don't think Penina didn't use that to her advantage, oh, favored one, with that little snarky, oh, child of God. Can't you hear the enemy? Oh, child of God, you're struggling. Where's your God now? That's how the enemy works. The irony of her name. But what God has named, the enemy cannot unname. What God has said is blessed, the enemy cannot unbless. What God has said is favor, the enemy cannot remove favor from. It might not happen in your season. You might not see it when you want to see it. But I promise you this, if God has blessed it, the blessing will come to pass. Because the word of God says, his word does not return void. The other irony for her is that God closed her womb. We have a really hard time when we hear, and it doesn't say it once, it says it twice, just in case you missed it, that it was God. How do you justify when it's God who's closed your womb? How do you handle it when it's God who has said no? How do you deal when God in his um, uh, omnipotent power allows pain into your life? How do you handle that? Let me tell you this. Sometimes God has to break you to make you. Sometimes there has to be this brokenness to mold you into the image he is calling you to. Because in our own will, in our own way, we are not palatable. We are not, we, we're rigid. But when you're broken and you're a mess on that floor, 
all decorum. You are not demure. You are a puddle of tears on the floor. He's like, that, that I can work with. That I can do something with. But God had closed her womb. So we're, we're going to figure out why here in a little bit. But the other ironic thing that's happening here, and this is one of the reasons why you study the word of God, and this is why I'm so excited about the study we're doing, the feasts, because it mentions she's at a feast. She's not just at any of the feasts. She's at the most joyous feast. She's at the, the Feast of Tabernacles. It is the one that is prophetic of God's returning when he comes for the end gathering. It is the most joyous. It represents that, that feast, the wedding feast we're going to have with him one day. It is a joyful celebration. And it is, it is not just one day. It's like days of it. You know what's hard is to show up and put a smile on your face and act like everything is hunky-dory when you're breaking inside because that's the Christian thing to do. Yay. Life is great. Living the dream. <laughs> and, so, and she was, she was, Elkanah was a priest, so she, she was like that pastor's wife. Guys, I break too. I have barren moments too. And you, you, you smile and you put on your makeup and you, and you put on your heels and you go and you, you, you're there for everybody else and you're doing your thing, but you're breaking too. And then you have to get into worship and be joyful and excited and you're like, God, I, I don't know if I could do it. I don't know if I want to fake it till I make it. I just, I want to feel what I should be feeling and I'm not feeling it right now, God. And she had to show up to this at this joyful celebration that the Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot, the, it was an annual reminder that the people of God is the great shepherd that tabernacles among them to protect and to bless them. So she had to sit there across from Penina and pretend or try to conjure up this joy when she didn't feel protected because in her own home every single day she is being verbally attacked, who didn't feel blessed because her womb has been closed. But I have to bless God and I have to praise him. Yes, yes, you do. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Because he is still on the throne. Because even when you're in that winter season, just like Pastor said, what's happening in the heavenlies is all the angels and the 24 elders are gathered around and they're saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lamb who was and is and is to come. The Lord of hosts, the Lord of heaven's army is still on the throne. So though you are in winter, let me tell you what is not in winter heaven. Heaven is in full swing. Heaven is having a party. Heaven is rejoicing. Heaven is celebration. Heaven is the Feast of Tabernacles. Tabernacles. Heaven is the trumpet sound. Heaven is the Passover lamb. Heaven is all of that and more. So while we are suffering here in our winter, there is spring is coming. So we praise him through the circumstance because we know spring is coming. There is a shift, and I'm going to get through this very quickly because something happened. She finally said, enough is enough, and I'm sick of the winter, and I'm ready for the promises of God. So the first thing she did was she poured it all out. She vomited emotionally on the, on the tabernacle and did, wasn't afraid to come. Sometimes people are afraid to come to the altar because they're afraid of what their husbands will think or their children will think or their wives will think or whatever. Stop worrying about what other people think. If you need to get before the face of God, you get before the face of God. And she let it all out. And for the first time in history, she prayed to the Lord of hosts, the Lord of heaven's army. It wasn't prayed at Jericho where the battle was raging. You didn't see it there first. You didn't see it with Gideon and his mighty men. There were plenty of times for that word to be introduced for God. But it was a woman who was barren and broken and in winter that said, God, I need you to fight for me because I have nothing left in me. And if you don't fight for me, I am going to curl up here and die. And she knew to call on the host of heaven's army to fight when she could not fight anymore. That's the God I serve. And then she surrendered her whole desires because her prayer was this, God, 
If you give me a son, I'm going to give him back to you. I believe up until that point, she would have kept any child God gave her. She would have helicoptered over that sweet thing, never cut the umbilical cord, and mummified him till nobody wanted to marry him. But something changed in her because she became so desperate for God and desperate for the will of God and desperate for the purpose of God that she said, God, I yield my desires to you because you said if you delight in him, he will give us the desires of my heart. Not my desires, his desires. He will come in and change them so that now I don't just want a child. I want a child that I can give back to you. I want a child that will serve you. I want a child that will walk in his purpose and his destiny. And at that moment, I can't confirm it. I will ask it and add it to my list of questions. Hey, God, was, was, that, was that the moment that you said, all right, sister, that's what I was waiting for because I need to bring forth Samuel. I need to bring forth the last judge of Israel. I need to bring forth the one who will bring Hophni and Phinehas down who are, who are prostituting and making the, the temple of God unholy. I need somebody that will listen to me and I'm going to raise him up and he's going to anoint Saul and he's going to correct Saul and then he's going to appoint David and David's going to become the lineage to open the door to my son to come in for deliverance. So he needed a woman who was willing to say, I am desperate for whatever you have. And she surrendered it all. Then she got up from her seat and she changed the pattern. She changed the pattern. Because before this, she always sat and moped and cried. But it says she got up and she ate. Let me tell you, do not underestimate the power of a good meal. Because if you and I are eating some Chico Fiesta, I am not crying. And if I'm sitting across from my Panina, I'm going to smile with cheese dripping off my chin and say, what's up, girl? She changed her pattern. And she said, I'm no longer going to be the victim. I'm no longer going to walk around with that mentality. I'm, no, I'm going to eat and celebrate God's goodness. And she did. And then she went home, plug your ears, kids, and she got busy. Because the Bible said that Elkanah knew Hannah. That word knew is intimacy. So she went home and she shaved her legs she put on her moo moo because we all know that moo moos gave birth to 14 children. Victoria's Secrets only gets you two. And she said, This is it. I'm, my baby is coming. My child is kicking. My promise is in the making. He is forming it in my womb, and I'm getting ready to have birth in this place because he made me a promise. And when my God makes me a promise, he does not like man that he should lie and go back on it, but it will come forth. And I don't know who has a promise for a child, for a husband that they are standing on, but this year is your year, Brittany. Something is breaking in your household this year that God said everything you have prayed for and you have believed that this winter is over and that he is calling forth the head of your household to rise up and call you blessed. This is just the beginning. God has a promise in each and every one of us. Your weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Your weeping may endure for a winter, but spring is coming. Spring, life is coming. Your scars can be your bitterness or your scars can be your witness. Because two years later, she shows back up at that tabernacle. Eli can't even recognize her because God, the word of God says he remembered Hannah. And you're thinking, how does he even forget Hannah? He's God. He didn't forget Hannah. 
I want you to think of it this way, that life had shattered her, that winter had torn her apart. Every word that Penina had said had sunk into her spirit and her soul. Her husband gaslighting her and telling her that he should be more, he should be enough and not listening to her pains and her hurt, being judged in the church by the priests of the house. She still came back to the house of God and she said, he remembered me, he put me back together piece by piece he showed me God will remember you he will put you back together I am testament of that that my winters never became my bitterness they will always be my witness that I serve a good God We're gonna have Miss, I did decent, babe, only once, six months over, two minutes over. We're gonna, Miss Judy's gonna come up to bless us and close us out. And our prayer team will be up here, but I'm gonna be up here praying for anybody that if you're honest enough to say I'm in a winter and there'll be other people here and I'm kind of doing it alone, let us pray with you. Don't be ashamed. Get a Hannah mentality and say, I'm going after it. Change the pattern today. Let's 